Hi guys, uh, you join me on the banks of the River Avon. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be allowed to come fish here. Uh, it's part of Manningford Trout Fishery uh, and Malcolm's given us uh, the chance to come out and uh, do a little bit of grayling fishing. It's coming to the end of January now. Um, and I know quite a few of the chalk streams have actually finished their, uh, their season for the year, despite the fact the grayling season doesn't finish until mid-March. Um, but we're just come out for a day's fishing. It was very cold last night. We, we got up to minus five degrees this morning when we uh, when we awoke and a, and a thick heavy frost so hence the reason that we are thoroughly togged up with all our gear um, but it's a beautiful little bit of river it's towards the top of the river Avon um, and we're looking to just get a few fish a couple of grayling before the end of the season it's not going to be a particularly technical film um, we're going to look at a few different techniques obviously nymphing being the main thing um, it, we were hoping we might get a bit of sunshine come out, so it's made fish spotting really difficult with these overcast conditions. Um, but we've set up with some nymphs. Um, I've got a nine and a half foot uh, three weight rod here, um, and it's a Euro style nymphing outfit that I've got to begin with. Um, so I've got sort of a 15 foot knotless tapered leader with a, a bit of indicator you can probably see there, um, and just a couple of flies on about a five pound fluorocarbon leader. Um, but we're not gonna stick to any technique in particular hard and fast today. We're going to ring the changes. The, the river changes quite a bit from the, the upper stretches being really quite small um, and down towards the bottom section it sort of doubles its size. So we've got four or so miles of river to go out today. So we're going to chop and change. Start off with the Euro nymphing because there's a couple of deep pools we want to have a look at. Um, and then down towards the bottom end we'll do a bit of searching out with some duo. And So we're going to be changing, and changing our tactics as we go along and hopefully we'll get a few fish on the bank and give you a few helpful hints and tips towards the end of the grayling season. downstream just to make sure I'm not causing any drag myself. Just coming down at the same pace of the river. I'm just keeping an eye on that little bit of indicator. It slightly moves in any way, shape or form. I'm going to strike because you're never sure 100% whether it's the bottom or whether it's a grading just quickly grabbing your fly. All I'm doing is just systematically covering this river so that I'm happy the inside, the middle, the far side, all covered. And then just slowly make my way upstream. And if I come across a piece of water that's a little bit deeper, I'll just, if I'm not catching bottom, then I'll just swap out, just caught bottom there. If I'm not catching bottom, then I'll just swap out for a slightly heavier fly until I am catching bottom. I'm less worried about the actual pattern and more worried about the the weight of the fly, making sure that it's in the right place because so much of what grayling eat is either on or just off the bottom. So if I'm not catching up every now and again, then I know I'm not getting deep enough. I know I'm definitely getting down deep enough now with this one. Hopefully we'll just trundle it past a, a grayling and see what they think. If you find that you're struggling with your indicator, if it's getting pulled under a little bit, if you want to make sure it stays up on the surface a little bit more, I normally just carry a, a little tub of mucilin with me, just the, the grease. And that normally is enough just to bring it up in, high on the surface. So. Just working my way up nice and slowly. Just making sure that I'm happy that I've covered the water that's in front of me. Yep. Well, just that change of fly made all the difference. Just gonna come downstream just a little bit from there. It's actually a little beautiful wild out of season brownie bit of a change of fly there and as you can see we've resulted in an absolutely beautiful 
beautiful out of season brownie now. I've been lucky enough to fish here before and is that not one of the most beautiful marked fish you've ever seen? And there's that little pheasant tail just nestled in the top of his jaw. I'm just gonna unhook that. That barber's hook will come out nice and easy if my fingers will allow me. And just absolutely perfection in miniature. Look at the colours on the adipus fin there. Just stunning. Just make sure he's okay. Nice and happy to go away. Such a beautiful, beautiful trout. Let's see if we can, not quite what we were after. We are looking for grayling, but you know, it's one of those things you do. Unfortunately, you'll always end up catching an out of season trout, but just, you know, take care of them. Make sure they go back nice and easy like that and they'll live to get a little bit bigger. But we'll get back up into that water, possibly holding another two fish, three fish in that little wee spot. We'll just uh, go back, have another try, and see if we can come in contact with the grading this time rather than an out of season trout. Now you might have noticed over the course of today that I don't actually wear a waistcoat. Now I used to always have a waistcoat, but I found I actually carried a lot more stuff than I needed. And my biggest problem was I could never actually find where it was that I'd kept where the stuff I'd put into it. So I could kind of feel it, but never actually find which pocket to get to it. So probably about four or five years ago, I swapped over to a sling. Um, this one's the, the Patagonia, which has been absolutely fantastic for me. And it just allows me to sort of slim down what I do carry. Um, and I just carry the essentials. So you probably saw when we were setting up, I've got a big big uh, stack of spools here. Um, these are the Rio ones, which all st stack together and interconnect. And I've got various different Fluoroflexes, Fluoroflexes Plus. Um, I've got Powerflex, Powerflex Plus in various different sizes. Um, they're always really useful and, and you can just see from the side what it is. It'll tell you whether it's Powerflex Plus, whether it's 6X, 5X, 4X. So that's really a really useful thing to carry. Along with that, I've, I've had one of these for years. It's just a little uh, wallet that I carry a, a, an array of um, knotless tapered leaders in here from seven and a half foot up to about 12 foot, um, along with things like French Nymph and Euro style leaders as well. Um, always have some floatants with me. Um, I carry gink, it's in my bag, but I don't tend to use gink as much as I used to do. Um, I'm a big fan of the powders um, to really get the fly properly dry rather than always adding some kind of a preparatory mix to it. I prefer the desiccants which really just take all the moisture out and make that fly float. There's no problems with oily slicks or anything else like that. It's just a natural dry fly. So I always carry those around with me. Um, I'm sure like pretty much all of you anglers out there, I've got way too many fly boxes. Um, and I'd probably go back to the same two or three dozen flies that I have faith in. Um, that's definitely true on the still waters, less so on the rivers, where I've got a, a huge array of different sizes of flies, different colours of flies, um, and particularly when it comes to my nymphs, you know, I've got several different boxes um, of, of nymphs where I've got less patterns but I've got more of each pattern. So um, I might have the same fly in three or four different bead weights. So if I come to a piece of water that's a bit faster than the one I've just been fishing, I can change it out for one that's it's a heavier bead on it. So it's gonna get down that bit faster. Um, you know, I've got mixtures of like pink boxes for grayling. Um, I've got other boxes where I've got, you know, little my little black jobs as we call them, a mixture of uh, terrestrials, APTs. Um, there's some, some little beetle patterns. Um, so it's just having a variety of different weights and sizes of flies. Um, I'm, I'm less so, so worried about on the rivers of the particular pattern for, for my nymphs, just more worried about the weight of the fly and getting it down in that feeding zone. You know, as we've said before, uh, most of what trout and grayling eat is either on or just off the bottom. So having those beads in different sizes or not necessarily just a really heavy fly. Um, in the case of some of these flies here that have got super glue bodies, um, the, the bodies are very slim and they're very, very streamlined. So when they go into the water, even with a lighter bead on, they'll sink much faster than a, than a bushy fly that's got a, a big bead on it. So having a, a mixture of different sizes of the flies as well, really useful. 
and, and in this sling, you know, it's, it's on my back, it's out of the way, it holds my net, and when I need it, I can just swing it around, and it acts like a little workbench for me, and you know, I can pop the zip on top, and I can get my stuff here without being worried about dropping it into the river. So, just a few of the bits and pieces that I carry with me, um, and we're just gonna go and carry on and see if we can get another fish before it gets too dark. shows a perfection loop. Now these not as tapered leads, they all come with a perfection loop on the end. But one of the things that I like to do to make it sit better on the end of the fly line is if you just squeeze it together and then just in your teeth just give it ever such a slight little squeeze in your teeth. And you'll find instead of being that such an open loop you can see now that's a fairly tight loop. So when you loop to loop that onto the end of your fly line, it's gonna give you a much better connection and a much better transition of energy. It's just a little thing that I've always done. Um, I remember years ago watching Ollie Edwards doing it and he carries a, carried a spoon around and he used the spoon to sort of straighten it to give him a bit more of a, a point in that leader. Um, <clears throat> another thing to make sure you do is with these knotless tapered leaders, as soon as you take them out of the packet, just give them a, give them a stretch because they've been sitting in a packet for who knows how long and they're all tightly coiled and you want this to lie as straight as you can on the water but as you're going down the leader don't forget it's getting thinner and the braking strain is getting lower so don't give it as much stick at the bottom end as you do at the top end because this is only going down to about a three and a half pound point so if I pulled it as hard at this bottom end as I did at the other end that's probably around about 50 pounds in braking strain then pretty quickly it's going to go pop and just simply by pulling that nice and straight all of a sudden that memory's just started to come out of that leader and when we cast that's going to land and sit so much more straight on the water and then simply to attach them all we're going to do is take the bit back end of the not the tapered leader it's got the loop in it and that my fly line i'm going to place this over the top of my fly line and then through the loop i'm going to pass the rest of the leader and pull that through and what this gonna, is going to do is give me what's known as a figure of eight handshake loop so when that pulls down you've got a much better transition of energy from your leader to the end of your fly line so when you're casting that tape is going to allow that leader to straighten you're going to get much better presentation so we've come down from the top of the river now the top of the beat where it's quite small where we, we fished that euro style leader because we wanted to you know search out those deeper pockets with some quite heavy flies but we've come down to the, towards a lower stretch now and it, it's quite a bit of a different river now it's it's quite a lot wider uh, it's a fairly steady flow in places here and and it's a fairly even uh, depth th throughout a lot of the river i mean there are deep pockets as you'd expect but stretch we're just going to come onto here is it's there's not really much happening and it's all fairly steady in its flow so we're just going to use the the duo which is uh, also sometimes known as the clink and dink or some people refer to it as New Zealand style of fishing. So all we've done is we've just put that nine foot knotless tapered leader on, which goes down to about a, a three and a half pound point. On the end of that, we've put a really nice, large, buoyant fly, which has this indicator post and plenty of hackle on it. It's a parachute fly. And on the back end of that's just a little tiny loop that's been attached. And from that, we've just put a snood of fluorocarbon that's probably about two, two and a half foot long. Um, roughly about the same sort of depth as the water we're looking to fish and then just a little beaded fly on the end of that so this fly that sits on the surface not only does it act as a dry fly um, but if, if a fish does come up and take that obviously we'll see the visual take as it comes and breaks the surface but while this little nymph is bobbing along behind hopefully somewhere close to the bottom if a fish decides to take this nymph then this will disappear and act as a, an indicator so it's a really useful method for for not only fishing the surface but fishing the, the bottom at the same time but it's great for searching out when there's no fish there's no fish rising or flies hatching so we've got a bit of a nice run along here and we can just systematically get in the river cast from one side to the other take a couple more steps cast one side to the other and when we're satisfied that we've covered the whole river 
then uh, we just keep moving on up the river and hopefully one of these grading will take this nymph or take this dry and we should uh, should be connected so let's, we're going to jump in now and see how we get on so just covering this water as we go up oh that's probably bottom but you see same way when we were using that French Euro style nymphing earlier the second that indicator, or in this case, the second that dry fly moves, dips, deviates in any way, shape or form, I need to strike. Now, there's a good chance it's the bottom, but if it isn't the bottom, then it's a fish. And if we're not quick enough on it like before, then that fish is going to grab the fly and spit it out before we've had a chance to set the hook. So you need to be on it straight away. Literally, as soon as that fly goes in, I'm watching that dry fly come down, if that disappears, oh, like that, could have been a bottom, and I'll strike straight away. Now it's hard to tell how deep the water is up ahead of me, so that could well have just been a, a little bit of the weed that's up here ahead, because it was quite quick after the, the cast that that went, so. Concentrating on that fly as it comes down. Now you want to make sure that obviously your fly is going to get down the nymph, but you don't want it to be too heavy that it's going to drown your dry fly because you want that to stay right up on the surface. And as that drifts down to me, I'm just keeping up with the rate of the line coming down just by a fast figure of eight in my left hand. I'm just using that left hand just to manage that line as it comes down. When I'm satisfied that I've covered from the left hand side of the river through the middle over to the right hand side, I'll just simply take a couple of steps and repeat. And what it does is it allows you just to systematically cover all the river that's in front of you because you're going from a fixed cast in front of you and just drifting it all the way down. So I know that in theory, every bit of that river I've covered. And hopefully, should have covered a fish or two. If I'm really lucky, I'll cover a hungry fish. So when you bring in this fly back down to you, obviously we want it to drift at the same speed of the current and I'm taking this in with a, a fast figure of eight which I know some of you struggle with a fast figure of eight so don't worry just bring it in hand over hand just with a strip the only thing to make sure you don't do is you don't pull it so fast that you actually sink the fly so just ever so gently keeping up with but not overtaking the drift of that fly and it just means that you can just slowly manage it just a foot a foot a foot all the time i'm concentrating on that fly but i'm just bringing in that line so if a fish does take i've only got a short line left out the top of the rod so i can get into contact with that fish that's just taken if i just leave it and let this line start to come around and you'll see it'll double over here. Well, as soon as it does that, it doubles the speed of the fly line. It pulls it downstream. And as soon as that fly starts to travel faster or slower than the pace of the river, that to any fish looks unnatural. So it's all about making sure your flies come down at exactly the same speed as the current. Yep, just right at the end. Oh, just lifting off. It's a nice grayling. Taking a little bit of time. It just goes to show a little bit of perseverance. 
and there we go, she's in the net. Well, we persevered. I mean, we fished through maybe, I don't know, about 70, 75 yards of water and we've, you know, meticulously covered the water with the duo there and changed up from the slightly lighter fly to the slightly heavier fly, particularly for this water. You can see I had to change my retrieve to keep up with the line. And just at the end of the retrieve, as the fly started to lift off the water, boom, grayling's come and taken it. It's a beautiful looking little fish, not a monster, but uh, in such cold conditions as today, quite frankly, any fish is welcome. We've had a, a couple of fish already, a very small grayling, nice brownie on the, on the Euro style. And uh, finally, we've got one on the, on the duo. So we'll uh, just bring it into the side and have a closer look at it for you. So there we have it, flies popped out in the net, which so often happens, particularly with these barbless hooks. And there we have it. Not the biggest grayling in the world, but a very, very welcome fish after all that time of trying. So there we go, it's been tough going. The water is incredibly cold, but just giving him plenty of time to get the energy back and away. As usual, you bring a camera out, things don't always go to plan. It has been a grueler. The weather has been beyond Baltic. They reckoned it was going to be six degrees and I would be amazed if it's gotten much above one. Um, and uh, our hands and toes can uh, definitely uh, go with the fact that we're struggling to <laughs> struggling the feel. But you know, the sun's not come out and we've had to really work hard today, but we've just been systematic with these searching out techniques. You know, we've broken the river down into sections and we've covered that river before moving up. And if there's a fish out there that's even mildly hungry, we should have put a fly in front of it. We've had a few fish, we've dropped a couple of fish. Um, not quite the bonanza we'd have liked, but it just shows that even on the hardest of days when things are against you, if you persevere and you're systematic with it, these methods will catch you fish. Um, and hopefully they'll catch you a few more fish before the end of the grayling season. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. You've picked up a few hints and tips and tight lines for the rest of the grayling season. And we'll see you again soon.